43, welcome to the chapter eight summary keynote. So here we're gonna take what we did in chapter seven, which was us learning about sampling distributions for means and proportions, and we're gonna use those rules, right? How did we figure out if our sampling uh, distribution was normal if we had a numerical variable? How did we figure out if our sampling distribution was normal if we had a categorical variable. What were those assumptions? What were their centers? What were their standard errors? And we're gonna use that to create confidence intervals. And if you're wondering like, well, what, what on earth is a confidence interval? Well, if we go all the way back to chapter one, when we talked about populations versus samples, and the numbers we got out of there were parameters or statistics, well, again, a parameter, it's hard to find, right? The only way to actually find a parameter is to run that census. And we have our population, right, mean, which is mu, our population standard deviation, which is sigma, and our population proportion, which is p. And those are, again, very difficult to find because you would have to run a census in order to find them. So what we do instead is we find statistics because they're easier to find, right? And then we have a sample mean, a sample standard deviation, and a sample proportion. And we'll take those statistics and we'll use those statistics to approximate parameters. So if I want to approximate mu, I will take x bar and I will add and subtract a margin of error on either side of it to get something called a confidence interval, right? It's just an estimation, all right? An approximation of a parameter. So let's make sure we get that vocab down. So when you hear me talk about point estimate, that is quite literally one number. Another vocab term we have for point estimate is statistic, right? So all those stats that we've been finding, those single numbers, those are point estimates, quite literally one number on the number line, all right? And what we're building up to are confidence intervals, which is a range of values, all right? An interval of values to estimate this parameter. And typically how our confidence intervals work is we have our point estimate and we use that to construct a confidence interval. We always start with that number right there in the middle, that stat, that point estimate. We subtract a margin of error from that point estimate. We add a margin of error to that point estimate. And those give us respectively the lower bounds of our confidence interval and the upper bounds of our confidence interval. And that's all a confidence interval is, is we, we are saying that if we ran the census, we think the parameter is somewhere between here and here. 90% of the time we do, uh, we, we work through this kind of methodology, the, the parameters caught. So that's all a confidence interval is saying. It's just a range of values. Instead of just one number, we're going to give you a range of plausible numbers. All right, so let's take a look at confidence intervals for proportions. So there's our formula, right? Here's our statistic. This whole business here is a margin of error. All right, so we've got our critical Z star value and then our standard error. All right, now, the, to get that Z star, that critical value, you could use your calculator, you could use inverse norm, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later, but typically for the most popular confidence levels, like 90, 95, you're just gonna use that table and we're gonna use that bottom row down there. All right, now, in terms of assumptions for confidence intervals in proportion land, here they are, right? We want a random sample, or our sample represents our population. And the deal breaker is that we need at least 10 successes and at least 10 failures in our sample. And that is by far the most important uh, assumption. That's why I call it the deal breaker. If it's not met, we have to stop the problem because I, if it's not met, then I can't say that my sampling distribution is approximately normal. If it's not if it's not approximately normal, then normal CDF is out the window. All of our Z star, Z star critical values are out the window. That's why this is the deal breaker. Now, we want our sample size to be small relative to our population so that we can sample without replacement. True sampling should be done with replacement, but most of the time in the real world, we're doing it without. And as long as our sample size is less than 10% of our population, we're good to go. And then we have our interpretation, right? We're blank percent confident that P, the true proportion of whatever the context is, is between the lower bound of your confidence interval and the upper bound of your confidence interval. All right, let's take a look at how we run this for means, right? So if I'm in mean land, the thing that I pick up is now I have the T star critical value and I have a degrees of freedom. 
number that I have to keep track of. Now, we can use the table to get our T star critical value, or you could use inverse T. That's also a possibility. Your T star values are everywhere else in the table, just not that bottom row. And we always go down the rows to the appropriate degrees of freedom. And then we go across the columns to the correct confidence level. And you play it conservative. And what I mean by that is if you're just looking here, and I'll just give you a for instance, you can see there's a gap between 50 and 60. So let's say my sample size was 58. That would make my degrees of freedom 57. Now, even though 57 is closer to 60, than it is to 50. I can't use this row just yet because I haven't attained 60 degrees of freedom. But I've definitely passed through that threshold of 50, so I'll just use that, that number that's in the row for 50 as my T-star critical value. And if you ever wanna get an exact value, your calculator or technology in general is capable of doing that. All right, now I have this spiel here, right? If you know the population standard deviation, you can go ahead and use a Z-star critical value. And there are times when we assume we know the population standard deviation from a previous experiment. Um, I, I just find that usually that doesn't happen. That's why in this class I've been saying, we're just gonna go ahead and use a T-star critical value, all right? And, and most statisticians would do it. T-star values, they're a little bit larger. If you've ever taken a look at this table, you'll see all the T-star values are a little bit larger than the Z-star values as you get down to the bottom of that table. I mean, it gives you a slightly larger margin of error, which, which is okay. I mean, that's a trade-off. You have a larger margin of error, but you, you're, you're playing it safe, being a little bit more accurate. Okay, so with that, let's talk about that T-distribution. All right, it looks like the standard normal curve, except the tails are a little bit higher and the peak is a little bit lower. And that will change as the degrees of freedom increase. And I'll show you that in just a, in just a moment. So it's still all the T distributions, and there are infinitely many of them. There's a T distribution for every degree of freedom out there. They're all bell-shaped and centered at zero. They are more spread out, meaning they have larger tails, right? Um, they have this degree of freedom associated with them, and the formula is always sample size minus one. And there's, there's a video inside the lecture notes that explains that a little bit better. Um, as sample size increases, the shape of the T star graphs look a lot more like the standard normal curve, the Z star graph. Um, and I, I gave you this little graphic here to show you that as degrees of freedom increase, and you can see it here, I'm going from one to two to five to technically infinity, or I guess not technically, theoretically infinity. And you can see that the peak gets higher, right? One to two to five to infinity, and the tails get lower. One to two to five to infinity. And that's generally how, how those T-star curves work. All right, the peaks get higher, the tails get lower as degrees of freedom increase. And we tend to use T-star critical values when our sample size is below 30. If the sample size is 30 or higher, you can use a Z-star or a T-star critical value. Um, some statisticians feel like, oh, the central limit theorem is kicking in at 30, so I can go ahead and use a Z-star um, critical value. I, I personally don't subscribe to that, and that's why you're seeing me just using T-star critical values in all of the lecture notes. So I always say, if you don't know the population standard deviation, you might as well go T-star. All right. So if you're in mean land, here are your assumptions. And again, normality is always the deal breaker. So either the population distribution is stated to be normal, the sample size is 30 or higher, or you've made a graph, probably a box plot. That's the one I typically go with. And there's no outliers present. And then you can go ahead and interpret it. And this, again, is just interpreting the interval. The level has a different interpretation. We're blank percent confident that mu, the true mean, whatever, is between, again, lower bound of your confidence interval, upper bound of your confidence interval. And you should have units on this one. Um, I guess technically you had units on the proportion one, but the, the units in proportion land are percentages because you have a categorical variable. If you're in mainland, you've got a numerical variable and it's got some units with it. All right, so typically, all right, your workflow, we're gonna talk about that. Start with your assumptions, all right? Always check your assumptions and then also interpret your interval even if you're not specifically asked to in the problem. But start with your assumptions. Make sure you tell me what you're doing, right? Do you have a one sample proportion Z confidence interval? Do you have a one sample mean T confidence interval? Go ahead and construct it, right? Now, when I say construct the interval right here, this is the number crunching. This is where we're using our calculators. We're actually figuring out the lower bound and the upper bound. Do some number crunching. 
and then go ahead and interpret it. All right. And you're going to hear me repeat this, especially in chapter nine. Check your assumptions. All right. Chapter eight and chapter nine, check the assumptions. If you ever move on and actually take a look at chapters uh, 10, 11, 12, and 13, check your assumptions. Anytime you run any kind of inference, meaning a confidence interval, or when we get to chapter nine, a hypothesis test, you've got to check your assumptions. So make sure you know what they are in mean land. Make sure you know what they are in proportion land. All right, so now let's talk about how do you find a critical value that's not on your table? Because that's gonna, we did one of those examples in our chapter, uh, I think chapter eight packet, yes. And then you, it's on your homework as well. So if you're in proportion land, you're gonna use inverse norm and you're gonna put in the percentile. I wanna be clear here, percentile. All right, and then we're gonna put in zero one because that's the mean and standard deviation whenever you're in um, proportion land or whenever I should say, not when you're in proportion land so much as when you're on the Z, um, the standard normal curve. Now, let's say I wanted a 90% confidence interval. All right, so if I want the middle 90%, I wanna be clear that the middle 90% does not translate to a percentile. We have to mess with it. So if you want the middle 90%, all right, so imagine 90% is in here. Well, we know from the complement rule that if 90% of the area under my curve is here, then 10% is outside, but that will split up to 5% on each side. All right, and I can actually just forward what I have here. So let me go ahead and erase some of the last things I wrote just so it's not overlapping that way. So we've got these outer 5%. Now, if I want to take this number, or whatever this, this position here on the curve is, and turn it into a percentile, you can see I wanna calculate the area from here on down. So that would be 90 plus 5%, or really that would be the 95th percentile. And because that's the percentile, that's what I'm gonna be plugging into my calculator. And that's where I'm gonna get 1.96. So this would give you the critical, oh, excuse me, not 1.96, my bad, 1.645. So that's what would give you the critical value for a 90% confidence interval. So you have to get in the habit of converting the middle percent to a percentile in order to use your calculator. And I believe the newer calculators actually let you do the middle option, um, but I don't have a newer calculator. So if you have it, awesome, good for you. Um, take a look at your inverse norm and see if you have an option that says, I think they have like left, middle, right. But like I said, I've only seen it a couple of times because I, I don't personally have that calculator. All right, if you're in mean land, you can use inverse T. Same idea, it's a percentile, and you need degrees of freedom with it. All right, let's look at those margins of error. So we'll have margins of error problems uh, in our, our proportion land. Now, you can, I, you saw me in the videos. I actually like to solve these things and figure it out, but I think you'll probably prefer the, um, the inequality. And, and if you're in proportion land, and the sample proportion is unknown, we usually go, not we usually, we go with 50%. It's halfway between 0% and 100%, and it gives you a conservative estimate for your sample size, meaning it'll give you a sample size that's probably a little bit larger than you need, um, but it puts you on the safe side of things. All right, if you're in mean land, this will be the one time that we use the Z-star um, critical value in mean land, and that's because um, not every calculator has an inverse T function. So I have to have us use the Z stars there. And if again, if you wanted to do a margin of error um, calculation there, I, I would recommend the inequality. It goes quite a bit faster. All right. Now in terms of margin of error, let's talk about ways to increase and decrease the margin of error on a confidence interval. So the first way I'm going to, or first thing I'm going to um, put out there is what happens if I increase sample size? So before I show all the, the stuff about it, just take a step back and think, okay, if I were to increase sample size, what happens to my margin of error? Does my margin of error get smaller? Does my margin of error get um, larger? And again, think about, we keep using this phrase, when you increase sample size, you reduce variability, right? You're not as variable because you have more observations in your sample. And so that will decrease your margin of error. And let's take a look at it on this table. All right. So if I look at this table, if you pick any column, and for right now, let's just pick our favorite, the, the standard, a lot of folks like the 95% column. And if we look at that column, you can see as sample size increases, our critical values decrease, right? So you can see here, it started, if I had one degree of freedom, my critical value 
was 12.71. And imagine using 12.71 in your margin of error formula. It's going to be a pretty large margin of error. And by the time you get all the way down here at 1.96, it's a much smaller number. So you're multiplying into your margin of error a much smaller number, or I should say smaller numbers, as your sample size increases. So that's why I was saying when you increase your sample size, it decreases your margin of error. But keep in mind the trade-off for that, increasing sample size, if you're running an experiment that takes more time and it costs more money. All right? But then the trade-off is you have a smaller margin of error. All right, what happens if you increase your confidence level? So I want you to think about that. If you increase your confidence level, does your margin of error increase or decrease? All right, I'm going to increase my confidence level, so I'm going to be more and more confident, meaning the number of times I mess up is going to, it's going to go down, right? Because I'm becoming 90% confident, then 95% confident, then 99% confident. Now that's going to increase, excuse me, uh, well it is, it's going to increase your margin of error, but there's the the slide for it. Okay, so let's take a look at this on the table. So now go anywhere, any row you want. I'm just going to highlight the Z star row, but you can see here that as I, oops, I'm going to just write over, as the confidence level increases, you can see that these numbers are getting larger and larger and larger, right? And imagine if I was 50% confident, I'm only multiplying a 0.674 into my margin of error, Right? And that's that's great. That's not that large of a number. And you can see how much it increases if I need to be 99.9% .9 confident. All right. The next thing we got to talk about is interval versus level. So a confidence interval, it's just this range of values, right? From a low, a lower bound to an upper bound. And we say, hey, we think it's going to have the parameter in there. I think if I ran the census, the parameter would be in here. And that is different from the level. So Levels talk about the method that you're using so that if you repeated this, this process of taking a sample and then another sample and then another sample, so you keep sampling, sampling, sampling from your population and you create interval after interval after interval, one interval for each sample, then a certain percentage of your intervals are going to be good and a certain percentage are going to be bad. And when I say a good interval, it means you caught the parameter. Your estimate was a good estimate. All right. And, and, Sometimes when you run this experiment and make this confidence interval, you're going to get a bad interval, meaning your, your parameter was not in your confidence interval. And when we hear things like confidence level, right? So when you hear something like a 95% confidence level, it means if you ran your, your experiment 100 times, and that would take a while to get 100 samples and make 100 confidence intervals, then we expect 95 to be good and 5 to be bad. And I want to be clear that it won't always break down exactly 95 and 5. You have to think about it, about it as a law of large numbers. So if you ran it again and again and again and again, around 95% of your intervals are good and 5% are bad. And again, you won't know for any one individual interval you have, you don't know if it's bad or good. All right? You either got a good interval or you didn't. The parameter is either in there or it's not. Okay, So I always hear like, oh, there's a 95% chance the parameter is in there. No, it's, it's binary. It's in there or it's not. It's the method that you're using in repeated samplings that works 95% of the time. And for any one individual interval, you don't know if it's bad or good. The only way you would know is if you would run a census. And that's what I wanna show you on the next slide. So let's go talk about the 2016 presidential election because going into the election, there were a lot of folks that were saying Clinton was gonna be a clear winner. And I, I wanna be upfront on this, that uh, if you had asked me the day of, I would have thought she was gonna win, all right? I, I, I thought if I had to bet I was going to bet she was going to win, but I want to be clear that I was not surprised when it went the other way, all right? If you were reading the numbers, you, you should have been, well, depending on how you feel, you might have been worried that night. So I, I want us to take a look at some Florida data, right? So this is Florida data, and I, I'm going to take a look at this poll right in here, and I, I'm choosing it because it was, it was done right up close to the election day. I think the election that year was on November 9th. And so they surveyed 853. When you see LV, those are likely voters. Um, down here you see RV, those are actually registered voters. So I want you to see that this particular poll had Clinton up in Florida. So you can see they thought based on those 853 folks, 46% were going for Trump, 48% were going for Clinton. So that's why you see the Clinton at plus two over here. So what I want to show you is if you read this poll and you said, see, Clinton's up, 
All right. She and I and I, I get that you could say, well, it trumps up on this one and this one. But I, I want to point out that this poll, even though it had Clinton predicted to win, was still correct. All right. And if you were reading this poll correctly, you would have known it was a close race. And actually, if you were reading any of these polls correctly, you would have seen it was a close race. And I'm picking Florida because it's a swing state. Um, it's always up for grabs in an election. All right, so let's take a look at what's going on here. We're going to create some confidence intervals. So you see the margin of error there at 3.4%. And so let's go ahead and we're going to make a confidence interval. We're going to do Trump's interval first. So I want you to see Trump had 46%, right? So imagine his statistic of 46%, and I want you to plus or minus that margin of error. All right, we're going to assume our assumptions are met and we're going to go about our business. But I think you would give me that the upper bound of his confidence interval, if I do 46 plus 3.4, it was 49.4, right? And then if I subtract 3.4, it's going to be 42.6, right? So if I wanted to make this confidence interval, I would say we are 95% confident that P, the true proportion of Trump voters, is between 42.6% and 49.4%. All right, and we can do the same thing for Clinton. We'll just use her 48 number, right? So Clinton would be 48% plus or minus 3.4%. All right, and when I run those, oops, let me get this out of the way. I think that Clinton's going to be somewhere between 44.6 and 51.4. So people would read this and they say, well, see, Clinton's up because she can get 51.4% of the vote and at best um, Trump's only going to get 49.4% of the vote. So I want to take a look at what actually happened. Because one of the cool things about election night is you actually get the census, like you get the numbers. So here were their confidence intervals. And I want you to take a look at how the election results actually played out. And I'm going to zoom in on Clinton and Trump. All right, now keep in mind, before we do all this, I just want to remind you that that poll that we talked about had Clinton up by 2% right? It was plus two percentage points that they had her, if we go back to the last slide. Okay, so here's what happened on election night. Now take a look. Okay, so Trump got 49.1% of the vote, Clinton got 47.8% of the vote. And I would ask you, were those confidence intervals correct? All right, so let me forward this. Were those confidence intervals correct? All right, let's take a look at Trump's. 49.1, was that inside his possible values? It was. 47.8, right, was that inside her possible values? It was. So even though this poll had Clinton up by two percentage points, it was still correct, right? So when you hear phrases like, if, or let me go back, like if, if people were saying Clinton's going to win, I would argue you need to be careful because Trump was within her margins. And when I would say within her margins, let me see if I can head back real quick. And oops, let me go back through this, wait for it. When I say Trump was within her margin, right, if the margin of error is 3.4 and they're only off by two, you need to pay attention to that. That's a close race. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. I will see you in a bit. Bye.